We interrupt this episode to bring you the following message. Once upon a time, we released an episode so terrible, so grammatically suspect, so embarrassing, that within a week after its initial release, we unreleased it. We pulled it from the feed, and it has never been heard again by anyone who didn't hear it the first time. We were mercilessly roasted by the general public over one particular point of pronunciation that frankly destroyed the integrity of the rest of the episode all by itself. And for once, both of the wees who made this show at the time were to blame. There was no excuse, really. We just completely dropped the ball when it was time to check and double check. And so the episode disappeared in the mists of time, there to lurk and haunt at least one of us over the ensuing years. But also to serve as a reminder to do better. Which we hope we have done. But it's unfair to leave it languishing. The script was good and the other information it contained was worthwhile. It was just that one error that got repeated four or five times that made it unbearable to us and a source of derision to the public. So, let us not leave it unheard any longer. Let us slay the demons of the past and drag the episode into the light once more. And while we're at it, let's bring it up to date, get it up to the same standard as our more recent episodes, and then release it to you, the general public. Except this time, with a bit more attention to detail. This is GM Word of the Week, and I'm Fiddleback. We here at the Word of the Week understand the need to be cool. Seriously. Growing up as word-obsessed gamer nerds while the other kids were doing things like dating cheerleaders and throwing footballs and going to ice cream socials at the malt shop, we learned about how important coolness was in the same way that a person lost in a desert learns about just how important it is to drink eight glasses of water a day. Interestingly, we often think of the word cool as a bit of modern slang originating in the 90s. Or maybe the 80s. Or perhaps in the surfer culture of the 60s. Or with the cool cats of jive in the 1940s. Or maybe it comes from the roaring 20s, when R.J. Reynolds was trying to market its brand new brand of menthol cigarettes as hip and sophisticated. In any case, wherever it came from, it is definitely a 20th century term, right? It's certainly not something that Shakespeare would have used. It wouldn't have been mentioned in Beowulf. Or by the Roman philosopher Boethius. Right? Right? Well, by now, you know how this game works. Obviously, given these suspiciously specific denials, as they're called, obviously... We're about to tell you the concept of coolness has been around for a long time. But if you think about it, it's not really that surprising. You just have to realize that in the language, temperature and temperament have often been closely related. In fact, those two words come from the same linguistic root. They come from the Latin temperare, which means to be composed of mixed things. That's why when you temper a sword, you're heating it and cooling it rapidly. And when you temper yourself, you're holding yourself in check. The idea of temperament goes back to an idea that became prevalent in the Middle Ages. It was that certain people were composed of certain elements and humors and that combinations of these created your personality and your moods. And because humors came in moist and dry varieties, as well as warm and cold varieties, it also became associated with a mixture of temperatures. When the idea of temperament became associated with the concept of a fever in the 17th century, the word became associated with a measurement of the amount of heat in something, which explains why having a bad temper has come to be associated with hot emotions, specifically anger. Of course, it does help that anger, along with other emotions like excitement and arousal, actually do make you feel physically hot which is why we also often associate heat with lust and why we might describe an attractive person as hot. It all comes down to biology. When your emotions flare, perhaps because you're about to run away or get into a fight or 
Well, maybe you've been invited back to someone's castle to look at their etchings and engage in some vigorous physical activity. Your body wants to make sure you're ready for what's about to happen. Your blood pressure, respiration, and heart rate increase to ensure plenty of oxygenated blood is flowing through your body. That ensures your muscles will have plenty of energy, which is why you get red in the face and why you feel hot. It also focuses your attention and heightens your awareness. Your eyes lock in with laser-like focus and you become less aware of your surroundings, but more aware of the particular subject you are seeing. And that's why it can be very hard for someone to catch your attention when you're hot, whatever the reason for it might be. It stands to reason, then, that if passion, anger, fear, and arousal are hot emotions, there must be something on the cold side, too. We associate coldness with a lack of emotions. People who are ignoring us pointedly give us the cold shoulder. They are frosty toward us. A loveless person or a ruthless person might be called frigid, and so on. But cold bites. A cold wind stings the face. When we describe someone as cold, we are describing them as someone who is emotionless in a hurtful way, a stinging way, a cruel way. And between these two states lies coolness. A cool person is calm, collected, rational, unflappable. Someone nonplussed. A cool person is smooth. They're together, man. They rise above it. It doesn't get to them. They don't run hot, but they aren't cold. They just skate on by. That's why Beowulf kept a cool mind, and Theseus tells Hippolyta that seething hot brains have more passion than cool reason in A Midsummer Night's Dream, and Hamlet's mother tells her distressed son to sprinkle cool patience on the heat and flame of his distemper. By the 16th century, the word cool had become a part of various idiomatic expressions, including the idea of a cool hand and being a cool customer. By the late 1880s, the word cool became associated not just with being calm and collected, but also being worthy of respect. By the 1920s, it was unambiguously complimentary, a word of approval and even reverence thanks to songs like the Cool Kind Daddy Blues by Anna Lee Chisholm. By the 1940s, it was being bandied about in the jazz scene, and gradually the association with calm, rational, even-temperedness slipped away, until it became just a vague word meaning person or thing worthy of respect and admiration for, you know, reasons. But we digress, and it was that sort of digression that kept us from being labeled as cool. No one wants to hear someone say, isn't it funny how that word used to refer to an even temperament based on a misunderstanding of human biology by way of the four hermetic elements? The point is, we here at the Word of the Week understand how important it is to be cool. And that's why we don't try to inject too much historical accuracy into our games. We'd lose some of the fun things. We'd be less cool. As you might remember from earlier episodes, we'd have to give up cool things like studded leather armor and two-thirds of the awesome polearms in D&D. And we'd also have to give up the idea of wading into a medieval fantasy battle whirling two swords around. We're sorry to tell you that the idea of dual-wielding weapons is something that, at least in the Western melee combat world, wasn't really done. At least, there's very little evidence that the practice was ever really employed to any substantial degree. This was recently brought to our attention while we were watching some of our favorite historical combat recreationists on YouTube. It turns out that historical military recreation videos spend a good half of their time telling fantasy gamers why all the things that are cool in their games not only didn't really happen, but also would be really terrible if they did. Which is why they don't get invited to sit at our game tables any more than we got invited to sit with the footballers and cheerleaders. Because it's just cool to have a weapon in each hand and swing away. Whether those weapons are swords or axes or nunchaku or even guns. The gun thing, firearm experts agree, 
is especially stupid. The best way to fire a handgun, that is, the most accurate way, is to use both hands on one gun and sight down the barrel. The second best way is to hold a gun in one hand at shoulder level and sight down the barrel. Note that the key is sighting down the barrel. Believe it or not, the most important part of accurately shooting a gun involves accurately aiming the thing. Who'd have thought? Certainly not anyone who ever filmed a gunfight or dual wielded a couple of desert eagles in a video game. Firing two guns at the same time means you can't really aim effectively or hold either gun very steadily, which we think you'll find with almost all of the larger caliber weapons becomes vitally important if what you want to do is hit the person shooting at you instead of braining yourself in the forehead thanks to the recoil. And that means all dual-wielding pistols does is allow you to empty two magazines into the air, walls, and furniture around your opponent very quickly while he takes his time aiming and firing at you. But the pop culture method of wildly firing two guns at once, often while diving through the air, which also does not improve your aim, incidentally, the method, known colloquially as firing guns akimbo, has a very specific origin. It began to crop up in American Western films and television shows. It actually has some historical accuracy. Cowboys, outlaws, and other figures in the Old West did prefer to carry two guns. But that was because their guns were revolvers, and revolvers are a pain to reload. Carrying two loaded guns meant that you could drop your first gun when it was empty, draw your second one, and keep shooting. In fact, cowboys weren't the only folks to figure out this trick. Various users of black powder weapons through the ages, including some pirates, would carry two such loaded pistols into combat. The practice is known as carrying a throwaway gun. As far as wielding two melee weapons at once, we're not saying that never happened. But it is important to pay attention to where it happened, and what kind of weapons were involved. For example, there are a number of Eastern martial arts styles that involve wielding two weapons. In Southern and Oriental Asia, some varieties of martial arts involved wielding two combat sticks in each hand. That includes the Punjab martial art of Gatka and the Philippian art called Double Baston. Various Japanese martial arts involve paired weapons like the Sai or the Nunchaku. And famously, some samurai practice Niten Ichi Ryu, a sub-school of Kenjutsu that involved wielding a katana and a shorter sword known as a Wakizashi. And in the late medieval and renaissance era, fencing and dueling often involved wielding a dueling sword in the primary hand and a dagger in the offhand. The thing to note about all these practices, though, that distinguishes them from the D&D style of making two attacks in one round, is that such styles were generally used in dueling scenarios rather than battlefield styles, and generally against an opponent who was fighting the same way, more or less, as you were. Many of these styles also focus on using the offhand weapon defensively. Some paired weapons, like the Sai and Nunchaku, were actually specifically designed to be used defensively. In Europe, the practice of dueling with two weapons involved a rapier or other small sword paired with an offhand dagger. The sword was used for attacking naturally, but the dagger was used for parrying and trapping an opponent's weapon. As dueling became especially popular in the courts of Italy and France in the Renaissance through to about the 18th century, the weapons evolved over time. The various dueling swords became lighter and lighter so that they could be handled more deftly and they were more well balanced. Gradually, the cutting edge disappeared and the sword became purely a thrusting weapon. That allowed the duelists to maintain their distance and to fight side on instead of head on to reduce the target they presented. But more interesting is what happened to the offhand dagger, which became known as the parrying dagger. From the Latin word, Paradre, which means to fend off. The most prominent and well-known type of parrying dagger was one that many gamers have seen written down and often mispronounced as main gouch, but is more correctly pronounced as man gauche. 
It's a French phrase and simply means using the left hand. The Mon Gauche is a long, slender dagger with a bell-shaped handguard and a prominent crossguard, and it is used for parrying and trapping an opponent's sword. And when most people hear the phrase parrying dagger, that's what they picture. But the Mon Gauche wasn't the only type of parrying dagger used in duels of the late Middle Ages and the Renaissance. Another popular choice was the sword breaker. The sword breaker was actually a form of offhand weapon that had been in existence for quite some time prior to duels becoming all the rage during the Renaissance. It was basically a broad, stubby dagger or short sword. It had a prominent cross guard to protect the hand, and one edge of the blade had a series of deep notches or grooves cut into it that made it look like a comb. The sort you'd fatally comb your hair with if you got confused. By using this design, with more than a little skill, you could, theoretically, catch an opponent's sword as he was swinging it at you. But despite the name, there's a lot of debate as to whether you could actually break a sword with one, or whether that was just a nickname derived from the fact that you could interrupt an opponent's attack with it. Part of the problem is that for much of the time they were supposedly in use, swords were heavy, sturdy affairs, which by design and manufacture, did not break easily. So it was doubtful a sword breaker used in the off hand would generate sufficient force to actually snap the heavy blades. As things progressed towards the Renaissance though, swords grew lighter and more agile, making the use of a sword breaker more likely to be successful. Although even this is doubtful. Possibly the coolest of the three main types of European parrying dagger though, is the so-called trident dagger. Trident, of course, means three teeth. The trident dagger was a spring-loaded parrying dagger. When a mechanism in the hilt was released, what looked like a conventional dagger blade would spring apart into three prongs in a W shape. That shape made it very useful at trapping an opponent's weapon. Of course, the complex trident dagger was developed later in the Renaissance period and was quite rare. But it was very cool. But why is historical dual wielding mainly about using the weapons defensively? Well, because it isn't very effective in battle, and it's very hard to learn. First, the effectiveness thing. When you use a melee weapon, you do one of two things with it. You're either thrusting or swinging. Either way, the weapon exists simply to focus amplify and extend your body's movements. A sword, for example, is swung with the entire body. Essentially, it's a lever. It takes the angular movement of your arm and your body's rotation and focuses that force along a very narrow, very sharp edge. When you thrust something, like a spear, you have to put your weight behind it to force it through armor and into body and all the gooey bits inside. When you are using two weapons, whatever they are, they can't both be used in the same effective way at the same time, or even in very close sequence. And sure, there are exceptions, as there always are. For instance, some of the fighting stick techniques use tricks with multiple body rotations and figure eight patterns to allow one weapon to follow the other. But those techniques are the rare exception, because they are complicated and hard to master. Which brings us to our second point, the hard to learn thing. You've probably heard of the old rub your tummy and pat your head thing, right? If you haven't, try it now. With your left hand, start rubbing your stomach in small circles. At the same time, place your right hand above your head and start patting it up and down. If you're not into that one and you're sitting at a desk, you can try this one instead. Pick up your foot off the ground and start moving it in clockwise circles. Now while you're doing that, write the number six on a piece of paper. In both cases, what you'll find is that your limbs have trouble working independently. They try to mirror each other. You start patting both your head and your stomach. Or your foot turns around and goes in the other direction. If you're very uncoordinated, your foot might just freak out and start wiggling, or you might fall over. We're sorry if you fell over. Maybe don't do everything the people on the podcasts tell you to. 
The fact of it is, your brain is not naturally good at conscious multitasking. That is, it is very hard for you to do two tasks, even simple tasks, at the same time, continuously. It turns out that people who claim to be good at multitasking are actually very good at switching their attention rapidly back and forth between two different tasks. But those little movement tricks we just had you do require you to actually maintain two independent actions simultaneously, which is very difficult. Ask any pianist or guitar player, and they will tell you how much time they spent learning a skill that musicians call hand independence, which allows them to play two different parts of a song simultaneously. Simply put though, Using one weapon to attack and one weapon to defend is far more effective and easier to master. It allows the wielder to switch their focus depending on the flow and cadence of the battle instead of trying to make two simultaneous attacks. And on top of the independence thing, human beings tend to prefer using one side of their body over the other. We have a dominant hand, for example, and when our brain processes what our eyes see, it uses one eye's input as the base and layers the other eye's information over it to create a three-dimensional image. That's called ocular dominance. However, let us be clear, this has nothing to do with the myth of lateral brain dominance. Yes, myth. There is no such thing. The myth goes like this. Your brain is partially symmetrical. That is, some of the structures on the left side of your brain are mirrored on the right side of your brain. That makes sense because your body is symmetrical too. Mainly what this means is that you have centers for processing sensory input on each side of your brain, and you have centers for controlling your muscles on each side of your brain. But due to the way your brain is wired up to the rest of your body, the sides are actually reversed. The right half of your brain takes in sensory information from your left ear and eye, and so on, and controls the muscles in your left arm and left leg. And the left half of your brain handles the right side of your body. The conclusion, obviously, is that one side of your brain is probably stronger than the other, since you have dominant limbs and eyes and ears and so on. If you are right-handed, the left half of your brain dominates. And we should also note, just to forestall some emails, that the eye dominance thing is actually more complicated than most people realize. It turns out that the left side of your brain gets input from the right half of both eyes. And the right side of the brain gets input from the left half of both eyes. So you don't have a dominant eye so much as a dominant side of both eyes. Sort of. Ocular dominance is actually even more complicated than that, but we digress. Where it gets weird is that there are some structures in your brain that aren't precise mirror images of each other. Generally, these are the areas that handle abstract bits of higher reasoning. The areas that cover things like math, spatial reasoning, language processing, and so forth. And if you dropped out of neuroscience school right at that point, you'd conclude that one side of your brain is more logical, for example, and the other side is more creative. And if one side is more dominant than the other, then being right-handed obviously means you're better at math, right? Well, no. Go finish your neurosciencing. First of all, even though some of the higher reasoning areas are slightly more dominant on one side than the other, the brain really is symmetrical, and there's a lot of crossover and symmetry. In fact, when people suffer damage to a specific region of one side of their brain, the other side can sometimes gradually take over for the damaged bit. This has been studied in patients with problems in the language processing areas of the brain. And that's because language processing is the main thing that really does seem to be very different on the left and right side of the brain. And those asymmetries can actually vary from person to person. The myth of right and left brainedness probably became quite widespread thanks to Robert Louis Stevenson's novella, The Strange Case of Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde. In that story, a doctor of cool temperament named Henry Jekyll has developed a potion that physically transforms him into Edward Hyde, a violent, lustful, hot-tempered man driven by his basis instincts. 
Having lost control of the transformations, Jekyll works feverishly to develop a counter potion. What's interesting, apart from the dual-natured brain thing that popularized the idea of logic and passion as two separate halves of the same brain, what's interesting is that Stevenson's story was actually inspired by real-life events. Now, the real-life events aren't that fantastic. They involve a cabinet maker and a locksmith named William Brody. He was well-liked and well-respected in Edinburgh, Scotland. Brody was so well-liked and trusted that he became a city councillor and a deacon. And many of his customers, wealthy individuals, trusted him with keys to their homes so he could deliver cabinets while they were not at home. Brody, however, being a locksmith, found it incredibly easy to make copies of the keys and use them to rob his wealthy friends. He used the money he gained to to finance his gambling habits, including betting on vicious dog and cock fights, running cons involving trick dice, and maintaining relationships with several mistresses. In 1788, an accomplice turned Brody in, and his double life was laid bare for the world to see. And Robert Louis Stevenson, who even owned a Brody cabinet, was so enamored of the story that he wrote a dramatic fictionalization called... Deacon Brody, or The Double Life. It was a play, and it failed to attract much of an audience. So he spiced it up a bit, with a medical potion, some pseudo-psychology, and a vile psychopath who trampled women dead simply for the crime of jogging his elbow on the streets. And that one! Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde. That sold pretty well. Which again just goes to show that coolness is always better than realism, especially in fictional entertainment. Thanks for listening to this redo of an episode most of you didn't hear in the first place, so we suppose it's all new to you. Probably it was just our imagination making us think we'd messed up so badly but we're happy to have it out in the open once again and the albatross off our neck. And hopefully, everyone will say nice things this time. If saying nice things isn't enough for you, you can always do what our valued patrons did and join our Patreon at one of the three very reasonable support levels. A dollar gets you early releases and transcripts, five gets you into the monthly chat, and for ten dollars... Why, for $10, we'll even make a special bonus episode once a month, just for you. Doesn't that sound delightful? Head over to gmwordoftheweek.com and click the yellow banner at the top to be taken to our support page, where you will find several options to offer your support, in addition to the link to Patreon. And if you've already given your support? Well, for that, we most humbly thank you. This episode was researched and written by Scott Rim, the Angry GM. Additional research and writing, as well as production, was by Brian Casey. Music was provided by Blue Dot Sessions. Creativity is allowing yourself to make mistakes. Art is knowing which ones to keep.